myself fashion. Um, I was reviewing what I had planned to do last night and I came across an entirely different uh, piece of material that I decided I wanted to use. Um, so what I'm gonna do is take you through this um, uh, application, it's called a click and learn. And so these are things that I use in my classroom a lot because it allows my students to kind of investigate these topics on their own. And this specifically has to do with mathematical modeling of population growth, okay? So I'm gonna kind of take you through as if you were a student and you were watching this on your own. There's, so there's a couple embedded videos that I'm gonna play. So um, this is less lecture, more demo, if you will, okay? So this talks about lionfish. Okay, and if you don't know about lionfish, um, they are an invasive species along the Atlantic coast and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, they are native in certain areas, but they got to where they didn't live before. So, so you can watch this. This is a model of the spread of lionfish. So you can start to see these red dots and these were confirmed sightings of these lionfish. Um, and you can see that it becomes more and more of a problem as we get closer to our current timeline, okay? So this would be the first embedded video that a student would watch. Lionfish are a uh beautiful tropical coral reef fish that are found in a wide area of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. The reason that people are concerned about them is that lionfish are now what we call an invasive species. They are now found in a part of the world's oceans where they don't belong. And so what has happened is over the last few years, probably through the release of aquarium lionfish that were brought into the United States, they have formed a population in the Atlantic Ocean and begin to spread rapidly. We know they have very few predators of their own in the Atlantic region. Sharks and other predatory fish just don't seem to be consuming lionfish and controlling their populations. Some of the research that we've done in the Bahamas where we've observed populations of native species that lionfish consume have shown that lionfish can reduce the biomass of their prey by 95% in just a two year period. What we're seeing is that reefs actually look very different after lionfish numbers have increased rapidly on them to the point where we're seeing some species simply are not being found on these sites anymore. So monitoring lionfish populations is incredibly important so that we understand where the invasion has taken hold, how many lionfish there are, and what kinds of habitats they're affecting. And so by understanding the numbers of lionfish that we have in the invaded Atlantic region, we can understand and estimate what their impact on native species is likely to be, and then also understand how much we might need to reduce the population of lionfish in order to start preventing those impacts from happening and protect our native coral reefs in the Atlantic region. Okay, so here you as students have been introduced to kind of the background of this phenomena. We know that lionfish are invasive. We know what invasive species are. We know the impact of those fish getting to where they are. And you're kind of introduced to this idea that the size of the lionfish population is going to be important. Okay, so they'd read some more background information. Um, these click and learns are really great because they have um, embedded links for vocabulary. Um, so a student would be able to hover over that if they didn't remember what population size meant, then they can find that out. Okay, next little clip. Some of the challenges that come specifically with monitoring lionfish are that they now have a range in the Atlantic and Caribbean that is over 4 million square kilometers. 
We're finding lionfish from very shallow waters in estuaries and mangroves, all the way to over a thousand feet deep, where a commercial submarine are seeing lionfish on the bottom. It's a huge range, so instead of censusing every single lionfish in the population, what we are able to do is instead sample the population using a variety of underwater ways of doing measurement. Some of the methods that we use to estimate populations of lionfish are what we call underwater visual surveys. This involves a scientist or a volunteer or a citizen scientist using scuba diving to go underwater and count fish along a certain area of the reef tract. We call this kind of survey a transect, and what we do in the survey is we would count all of the lionfish that we see within a certain area along a, essentially a giant measuring tape that stretched underwater. And by understanding the area that we searched and the number of lionfish that we've seen in that area, we can calculate the density of lionfish. By doing that same survey over a large number of different sites, we can begin to build a picture of what the average density is of lionfish in a certain amount of habitat, and then scale up that estimate to a broader regional level to understand what the population size might be. Sometimes we don't always have the ability to do these underwater transect surveys, and if we want to cover a really broad area of the lionfish population, we might have to use a different method. And that's where an underwater roving survey can come in handy. What happens with this technique is that uh, scuba divers will go underwater, and instead of using a large measuring tape to look at the area that they've surveyed, they will time how long they're searching for lionfish. And they will then count the number of lionfish that they've seen in a certain number of minutes <coughs> on their swim. The Volunteer Fish Survey Project uses citizen science volunteers who are scuba dive trained and travel all over the world to do recreational dives, often while they're on holiday. Even if you don't plan to become a marine biologist, you can still contribute to marine research through gathering data, even while you're on holiday or doing something on the side. Okay, so again, students are being shown the importance of this, um, different data collection methods for population surveys. Um, and so we're just scaffolding this background. And then we get to this great little graph here that auto populates. So this shows time on your x-axis, and I think I'm done with the video, so I'm just going to get that all the way down. Um, and the number of lionfish per 10,000 meters squared. So what this is asking the students to do, and what I'm going to ask you to do, is to tell me where you think the maximum number of lionfish in this area should be. So I'm going to click this, and I'm going to drag it up, and I want someone to tell me when to stop. So someone just shout stop. Right there? Perfect. So this number is called the carrying capacity. And the carrying capacity of a population is the maximum amount of individuals of this population that the environment can support. Okay? You can see that these population numbers went well above that carrying capacity, but then what did they do next? They dropped down. Okay, so we get this in real life, we get this oscillation around the carrying capacity. And we're going to see the difference between the real time data and the, um, the mathematical population growth models that we get from, from the next bit. Okay? All right, so now, now we're on to the math. Okay? We get the math piece. Now, I will tell you that in a biology class, um, you may see the fancy math model. But generally, you're going to see something way simplified. But I like 
giving the math. Oh, wrong way. Particularly these units of the equation get simplified, okay? Um, but the students would be learning here, and again, this is why I like using things like this, is that it gives you all of the information. So T is a specific point in time, N is the size or density, we're going to be looking at the density. You get delta T and delta N, which is the change of those two things, change over time, um, change in the population size. You get R, which is going to be the per capita growth rate, and K, which we just talked about, is the carrying capacity. Okay, um, so here's a general graph of logistic growth. And you, you know, those of you who are math people, we also call this what kind of curve? In refer reference to like what letter it looks like. Oh, well, I was thinking S, but yes, yes. <laughs> see, I, I'm from the simplified version of things, okay? And you can see this dotted line, this dashed line here. Oh, I'm gonna make this bigger. I didn't realize I wasn't using my whole window. There we go. This dashed line here is the carrying capacity, okay? So I wanna ask you a question just by looking at this, and I can't point at it too well. But as I go up this curve, as I'm going right here, what is happening to the slope of my line if I put a slope right here? It's increasing, okay? So what that means in terms of population growth is as we're doing this, more and more individuals are gonna be added to the population for each unit of time, whatever we're looking at, okay? Does that continue indefinitely? It continues to a point, okay? I get, I get your, your brain circles to a point, but then we start to see that slope of the line decrease, okay? As it approaches that carrying capacity, as the population approaches that carrying capacity, the slope of that line is going to start to decrease until it gets to what? What's the slope of a horizontal line? Zero, okay? Well done. I knew I had the right audience for this. Okay, so now, I'm going to have you act as students for me, okay? So I'm going to scroll down here, and I have this nice little table, and I have my equation. So we're going to do, we're going to do my simple equation here, and I will give you some numbers. So we're going to calculate this maximum growth rate times the population size at the start. So my population size, I don't know if you guys can see it, but we'll work together. The population, um, excuse me, the per capita uh, growth rate is 1.15, and my population at the start is 42. 42.08. Can someone calculate that for me, please? That's why I gave you calculators. <laughs> I just need one person to holler out the number. One more time. Is that 1.15? 1.15. Um, this particular application will not take anything uh, beyond the beyond two decimal places. So think about that when when you round your number. And it actually will tell the students when they answer the number whether or not that number is correct. Okay. So now. We're going to calculate this carrying capacity um, part of the equation. So our carrying capacity is 500. So we're going to take 500 minus our N, which was the 42.08, and divide that by 500.
Zero point, thank you. Nine two. Okay, so I go in here and I enter that, and that is correct. So now I can calculate my delta N over delta T or population growth rate, which is going to be my R times N multiplied by my carrying capacity calculation. Someone do the magic for me. Thank you. Thank you, Kaylee. Thank you. Because <laughs> guess what? Hold on. Let me show you. It would have told you it was wrong, which is nice. You get immediate feedback, which I love. Okay. So now to find out my N, my population growth at the end of this unit of time and the beginning of the next, I have to add what I added to what I had at the beginning. So 44.52 plus 42.08. I should be able to do this one in my head. 86.6? Oh, thank you. And in fact, it is. Okay? So if you are following along on the graph, you will now see that there is a new data point here that is populated. Okay? So to save time and energy, um, I am going to enter the rest of these from my handy dandy key. Apparently I have to click enter. Okay. And then the nice thing is, is after students get three rounds of practice at this, the rest of the graph and the tape, oopsies, 120. See, again, I know I made a mistake. The rest of the table fills in and the graph auto populates again. Okay? And the nice, a nice thing about the way this graph is organized is that you can see that carrying capacity calculation go from very close to one to zero, okay? And anything times zero is zero, okay? So then our growth rate is going to be zero. And you can see that we've met that carrying capacity right there. Okay. So next, it talks about revising the model because we use different types of models for different organisms that have different reproductive strategies. So the discrete time model, which was the one before with the time t and time t, um, are usually used for things that have a mating season or changes, fluctuation over time for when they are actually reproducing. Um, these lionfish, like humans, reproduce all throughout the year. So there's really no point in having a point in time. It's just going to be per whatever unit time you choose to calculate. Okay, so we use a continuous time logistic model, which means this R max is going to stay the same at any given time. Okay, um, let's see. All right. So again, we get an auto-populated graph where we have three different examples. This was the example of when we plot, when we use this mathematical model for continuous logistic growth, and then this is the discrete. You can see that they have that same shape, okay, that same predictive shape of an increase in growth rate until you reach a certain point in time and then you start to decrease. Um, this is where some of this information from like a previous lecture would come into play. We would have talked about environmental resistance. Populations running out of food, out of space, out of something, or the population numbers become so large that predators are like, ooh, smorgasbord, okay? So those are those things that will 
the environment pushes back on the population and causes that growth rate to slow. And then, of course, we have this actual data, which, um, as they mentioned in the videos, we can't always get actual data all the time. Okay, we have to use estimates because you can't, it's, it's nearly impossible to count all the members of a single population. Very, very difficult to do. Um, okay, next. Okay, this is one of my favorite ones um, because it is, in addition to auto populating, it is one that is interactive. So this green graphs population size over time, but then looks at a range. So it is, again, explaining kind of why these curves come out the way they do. So in 2005, there were only four adults, and we're looking at density here, four adults per 1,000 meters squared. And so the population size was really small. Population growth will be slower at first because we have smaller number of reproducing individuals. But the, the R realized, which is the number of offspring per adult, is going to be really, really high. If you have four adult populations, the average number of offspring per, per adult is going to be four. So four over four is going to be 100% increase per adult. So you're doubling that. Okay. But then we see here in 2008, there were 24 adults. And the model only predicts nine juveniles. Okay, resources start to be not as plentiful. If there's not as much resources or space, the reproductive capacity of those lionfish is going to decrease. So nine juveniles divided by 24 adults, that's a decrease. It's not a 100% increase per adult as we saw before, but this is 37%. And then again, as we get a bigger population, more constraints, we've got 40 adults, but a prediction of five juveniles. So that per, per capita growth rate, or that R realized, is decreasing over time because of that environmental resistance. So you can see these plotted against each other, population size increases, and this R realized that's on this y-axis will decrease over time. Okay, this is another one of my favorites um, that I saw, and I was so glad I saw this because um, one of the the material I was going to use before I came across this last night and decided to change my mind um, shows this slope of the line being made. So you can see these data points. There we go. We've got our time, we've got our population size, and we've got our population growth. Okay, so at time zero, we've got a zero population growth, but then we start to add to the population. And as I click each of these data points, you can see my slope of the line, and you can see it right there, that, that tilt, that shift. That's where that environmental resistance starts to come into play. Okay. So it poses some questions to students, so I will pose these questions to you. Okay. So over 2004 to 2006, when population size is small, what is the population growth rate? Is it greater than the later time? Is it less than the later time? Or is it about the same? When population size is small. Any guesses? It's less than. Okay, I'm all good for awkward silences, but I only got five minutes, so we're, <laughs> we're going to press ahead. Um, they get questions like, which of the following best explains the low population growth rate over 2004 to 2006? The number of individuals that can re reproduce is low. Yes, we're going to have that 100% R realized, but you only start with four individuals. 
so there's some, some jet lag that happens there. And then what explains the low population growth from 2011 to 2013? We have plenty of individuals that can reproduce, but food resources may become scarce and disease and parasitism might become more common because those are things that are density dependent. The larger the density of the population, the more you're going to have spread of infectious disease. So, and students would be able to save and um, the next part talks about these limiting factors for population growth. Um, but I'm going to stop now so I can have three minutes to get any questions that you might have for me. So I'm done. Questions? Yeah, oh yeah. boy. I yes? Have, I don't have a math question. Okay, do, okay. Do, what do they do? Like, what, what do they do for this? Like, do you know what they do to try and mitigate the population? With, and if you don't, that's okay. Well, no, no, no. Just well, just with, like, so from an invasive species perspective, yeah. the thing you want to do is to stop it from coming in in the first place. That couldn't have been avoided because it was in 1985 before we were like really paying, a, really paying attention to a lot of these things. Um, they can remove them, right? But that's hard. You can't, you know, you can't pour, pour bleach in the water. Because you, can't, you can't use any sort of fish asides, if that's even a thing. Um, you can remove them. I don't know that they do that because, probably because they're pretty and they might be like a tourist attraction and, oh, it's really cool, let's go diving to see lionfish. I don't know. But it becomes a tricky thing once they become established because they've been there for 38 years. What do we do now? I'm glad, so glad that wasn't a math question from Sarah. <laughs> what else, if anything? Oh boy, yes, Randy. So, will this model work in all kinds of other populations like land based animals, birds? Yeah. Or is it just specific to. No, it's not specific to aquatic. Um, let me see if I can show you. I can take you to the original thing that I was going to show you guys um, because I can show you real quick what I would use with this. Um, you can use something like this and I can build, I can start with 500 individuals. I can adjust my maximum per capita growth rate. So let's say we were studying something like elk where we want to know if increasing the number of hunting tags you provide will control a population. So I might decrease my maximum per capita growth rate to 0.4 instead. So yeah, those logistic growth models, I, I mean, there's probably a, a population ecologist might say something more specific. Um, but in general, the math works because you're looking at the number of individuals, their per capita growth rate, and the carrying capacity, and that's it. I saw another one. I yes. A I saw where the, I was going to ask where the website was at. Oh, website. oh, I'd be happy to share this with you because it's, it's one of my, it's one of my go-tos. It's my favorite. <coughs> yes, Chuck. Oh. How long have yeah, we been using? I remember being in Alfred, I couldn't tell you. Or just new. I don't know. I don't know. I, I know I this is what how I learned. So at least in the last quite, Yeah, I well <laughs> I, that's what I'm saying, you know, it is oh gosh. Way to make me feel bad. Okay. Yeah, we use that model to count like stegosaurus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs>